It's so good to be back with you all today. I'm excited to be here. I've um, been going through the book of Matthew just in my own personal time, and um, as I was thinking about what I wanted to share, uh, these this parable or these two small parables uh, really just, uh, yeah, I felt like God was leading me to share oh, just a little bit uh, on these. And so I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to share. Um, these two parables have, have really, um, well, caused me to think and to contemplate and like what, um, and I, I just thought I'd share that with you and, and uh, pass that on. So um, parable, what is a parable? A parable is um, it's well. It's, sometimes it's a short story or some sort of illustration to help uh, bring about truth and to help us understand and think differently about truth. See, parables were a part, a big part of Jesus's ministry and his teaching style. Jesus had the wisdom to, be able to simplify uh, these profound truths into these really simple stories. Some think that Jesus' parables were given to make things easier to understand. I'm not sure about that because there's many times where I'm reading a parable and I think, uh, what's going on here? Like, why would Jesus be, like, praising this? You know, um, we even have some of that in this story, and I'll get into that in just a minute. Like, sometimes parables make me scratch my head. And make me think a little bit deeper about something. But I think actually that's the point. Sometimes he wants us to think more deeply. He doesn't want us just to, to receive it, to be fed uh, like that just so easily. We even see this in, in, uh, earlier in chapter 13. That um, the, the ease of understanding might not have been his point when he said this. Uh, in verses 10 through 16, he says, This is why I speak it to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. Sorry. Um, in, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. See, Isaiah here, this, come, this passage comes right after he has this vision of the Lord, and Isaiah hears the voice of the Lord saying, who will go for us? Who shall I send? And Isaiah says, send me. And then he gets this message to go and, and speak to the people and tell them a hard message. Um, and this is the message. He's like, you'll be ever hearing but never understanding. Uh, and the, he's like, well, how long do I got to give this message, Lord? Like, I was wanting to go, but I don't, like, this is a pretty hard message. And he says, well, you're going to go until the people are, are gone, until they're in exile. And, uh, and so he's given this message to send them. But I think wrapped up in here um, is this idea of when, when Jesus is speaking and people come to him with a soft heart ready to receive what he wants to, to tell them. It says um, that they will be able to understand. If people have a hard heart and have these preconceived notions of who he is and the truth that they believe, and they come to a parable, uh, then, then, some th then maybe they're, they won't be able to see. Because it says, they, though seeing, they do not see, and though hearing, they do not understand. But if... If we skip back to that verse 16, but if they hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, I will heal them. And so the Lord is, is speaking in these things um, as, as a way to help people who, who want to know and want to go deeper to be able to understand the deeper things of the kingdom. And those who are already hardened their hearts towards this message, that their, mes their hearts would even grow harder, and they would uh, continue to um, go in their ways. 
But you see, parables weren't a new thing that Jesus started. Parables weren't a new way of teaching. Parables were a common way to communicate in this time period. Ancient Jewish rabbis would often speak in parables. And these parables would often come when a student of a rabbi would come to his master and have a question for him. And rather than just giving them the answer, they would often give them a parable that would make them think and maybe look at things from a different angle. This is kind of uh, the way that Jewish leaders of this time and other Eastern leaders would, teachers would, would teach. And as I was studying and, and reading on the parables, I learned that Eastern teachers liked to teach this way. They liked to teach in stories and, and, and illustrations and it, because it helped the students look at something from a different perspective, a different way to discover the, question, the answer to the question for themselves. See, what Eastern teachers understood is that when you just give people facts, facts can go in one ear and out the other. It's hard to retain facts sometimes, but if you're made to discover something on your own, if, you're, if you uncover this truth on your own and you're digging into the scripture and you're thinking through it yourself and you uncover this truth that's hidden in this story, then it sticks with you. Then you're able to hold on to it and grasp it. And that's the reason I think that Jesus often and mostly taught in parables is because he wanted these truths to stick. He wanted these things that he's revealing about his kingdom and about himself to stick. He didn't want it just to be laid out there and go in one ear and out the other. He wanted the, this to be able to, um, to be retained for their lifetime. See, we like ease and convenience. I don't want to have to work for it. Just give it to me. Uh, I'd rather just you know, go through the Wendy's drive-thru than have to slave over the stove and cook something. Right? I, I just ease convenience. That's me. Um, they liked this, but, th but these Eastern teachers and Jewish rabbis, they liked discovery and thinking deeply and wrestling with understanding. See, I prefer, and I think as our culture... We prefer clear-cut answers and interpretations, like it all fits together neatly and nicely, right? But these other teachers from the East, they preferred muddled and sometimes seemingly contradictory uh, m truths that their students would have to try to wrestle with and hold sometimes in tension with one another. For example, uh, uh, an example of these truths that maybe have to hold in tension, in Matthew 5.16, Jesus says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and give praise to your Father in heaven. Okay, so do your good deeds so everyone can see and glorify God, right? Then he follows it up in Matthew 6, 1 with, be careful that you do not do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. Hmm, these two truths, which one is true? Do we do good deeds to be seen by people, or do we not want to be seen by people? And I think the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. But it also helps us to keep a check and a rein on our hearts, right? What are the motives of the reasons we're doing things? Is it so that people will glorify God, or is it because we want people to see that we do these acts of righteousness, right? And so there's these truths that sometimes we have to hold in tension, and sometimes the parables can do this. And like, Ugh, I feel a little bit of tension about this. My point in all of this is that Jesus' teaching style often leaves us with tension. He's speaking to an audience about what his kingdom will look like. And sometimes he's purposefully not clear. So that those who have ears will hear the truth of the kingdom of God. But those who have their own preconceived ideas about what the kingdom of God is going to look like, that, well, it'll get harder. Um, and, and, and those whose hearts are already hardened to this notion, yeah, their, their hearts will get harder and they'll, they won't be able to understand and wrap their mind around it. And while I don't understand and that doesn't seem 
right to me. Like it just, it's hard for me to understand that. That is um, the way that the Lord works. And while those who are, yeah, open to him and responsive to this new understanding, the kingdom of God, they'll gain new insights to understanding. And so let's look at this parable again. This parable of Matthew 13, 44 through 46. And this is what it says. It reads, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then, in his joy, he went and sold all that he had, and he bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had, and he bought it. Hmm. Here we have two short Simple parables. It seems simple. Man finds a treasure in a field, and he covers it up. Then he goes, and he sells everything that he has so that he can buy this field and gain this treasure. Simple, though, as it is, this parable raises some questions. Like, why would someone bury treasure in a field? That's maybe a valid question. Uh, When he found it, was it ethical to bury it again and then go back and buy the field like you know it's a little bit questions that i come up with i don't know maybe you guys don't think of those ways um what does the treasure represent and while interpretations have varied throughout church history um these are important things to consider and think about real quick and so um but it's not the main point these aren't the main point of the parable but i want to just cover them real quick because i think that sometimes when we get hung up on little things like this, that it can often keep us from understanding and, and really diving into the main point of the parable. And so we see, uh, first, that this man found treasure buried in a field. Um, as we see in the parable of the talents, there are banks, because the master comes back to the, one, the person who was given one talent, right, And this person, what did he do with his talent, by the way? He went and buried it in the ground to keep it safe because he was afraid. So then when the master comes back, he pulls it up. And the master says, well, why didn't you put it on the bank? At least I could have gotten interest. So there were banks, but most common people didn't use the banks. They didn't maybe trust the banks. And so um, oftentimes, if there was an invading army coming, I mean, this nation of Israel, this was a hot spot for war. I mean, there were always being, uh, you know, battles and different things going on. Uh, And so, like, if there was an army coming or if someone wanted to really keep something safe, where would they put it? They'd put it in the ground. This is where, this is the safest spot. So if I have to flee my home and I have some valuables and I'm afraid, well, maybe raiders are going to come and take it while I'm fleeing, I'm going to put it in the ground. And when I come back, It'll be safe. I'll be able to come back and find my stuff, my valuables. Okay, that makes sense, I guess, in a way. Uh, I wouldn't probably choose to do that, but the, that was common practice. Um, the, but there was also this thing of, uh, what about finding this treasure? The man who found it, it would not be considered unethical for covering it up and purchasing the field. In fact, Jewish law stated, basically, whatever you find outside someone's house is yours. So basically, finders keepers is the Jewish law of the time. And so you find this treasure, it's yours. Yet, this person um, paid everything he had to purchase this field. And therefore, obtain this treasure, this valuable treasure. Now, what is the treasure? This is the big question of the parable. What's worth so much that the man would sell everything he has in joy to buy and to obtain this treasure? What is this treasure? And I think that throughout the the centuries, we see that it's often translated that, that Jesus 
that the kingdom of God, that Jesus is this treasure. And when we find him, when we seek after him and find him, that he, he becomes more valuable to us than anything else. When we seek Jesus, he asks us to give everything to him. But also, we have this joy to say, you know what? I will gladly, joyfully surrender all for you. When we find Jesus, we find this joy. He gives us grace and love and forgiveness. Um, and, but the cost sometimes may seem high. So this is the first parable, okay? The first parable is someone stumbles across this treasure and he finds this valuable treasure and he says, I must have it. I'm going to give whatever it takes to, ha- to obtain this treasure. The second parable is a little different. This one is someone actually seeking. The first one, someone stumbles across the treasure wow, this is so valuable, I'm going to do anything I can to possess it. The second one is someone's intentionally seeking to find this thing of great value. And when he, and the, everything else, though, is the same. When he finds this thing of great value, what does he do? With great joy, he goes and sells all that he has so that he could obtain this valuable treasure, this valuable possession. <coughs> Receiving it, um, receiving this, this treasure, the gospel of Jesus, brings joy to the finder. But those who find this treasure value it above all else. Not only does it bring joy, but they, it brings them so much joy that, in it, that they value it above everything else. And that's for me... You know, at times it can be a little convicting. Do I value this above everything else in my life? Do I value above all? You see, their sacrifice was not out of obligation or done grudgingly, but it was one out of joy. So let's think about this for a minute. Let's think there's a young man and a young woman, and they're... They, they see each other across the room, and finally they get the courage up to go, and they introduce, you know, that one of them introduces themselves, and they start getting to know each other and talking on Sundays. Maybe it's at church, whatever. And so they start talking, and then they find, well, we have a lot in common. And they start hanging out more outside of church, right? And they, they begin to uh, spend more and more time together. And one day, uh, the the young man says, well, hey, let's go for a picnic, right? And so they go out and they set up this picnic and they're enjoying their time together and they have, you know, they're just kind of laying back on the blanket and um, what, then the young man plucks up the courage to say, you know what, I love you so much that I want to marry you. And the young woman says, well, I love you but if you say yes to me, you're saying no to everything, everyone else. And I just want you to realize that. If you're saying yes to me, you're saying no to everyone else. And this young man has so much joy and value in this young woman that he's like, oh, worth it. It's totally worth it. I value, I love you so much that I will forsake all others just to be able to have and spend the rest of my life with you. Wow, what an amazing picture, right? And it's something common to us, but we don't often think of it like that. And yet Jesus is here saying that these people who find this valuable treasure give up all else, forsake all else, sell everything so that they might be able to have this treasure See, saying yes to one thing means saying no to all others. 
in this case. Maybe this is somewhat of Jesus' marriage proposal, right? Like Jesus is saying, hey, I, I found you. Would, you. would you love me? Would you marry me and forsake all else? And this helps shed a little bit of light on passages like we see in Matthew 10, 37, where he says, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And oftentimes I can read that and I think, whoa, Jesus, that's a little strong, coming on a little strong. But if we think about it in terms of this marriage, this idea of marriage, no, no. You wouldn't get to the altar and have you know, someone say, um, you're going through the vows and like, okay, hold on a minute. Um, I love you, but my mother's always going to come first in my life. <laughs> like, uh, hold on here. You know, like, <laughs> pump the brakes here a minute. You know, that wouldn't happen. It would be unthinkable. And yet so many times we say, yes, Jesus, we love you, but there's this other thing too that I really love and I don't really feel like I can give it up right now. And that's, I mean, I'm speaking from personal experience here. This is just me wrestling with that. And so what does it look like to sell everything that we might possess the greatest treasure? The greatest treasure. With joy, not grudgingly, by the way. It's not like, okay, I guess if I have to give this up, I will. You know, like... No, it's like, I want you, I love you so much, and I want this, that I'm willing to give up whatever you ask me to, to follow after you. Wow, that's love. That's love. That's commitment. Our joy in Jesus produces the willingness to give everything we have to God. Our talents, our time, our resources, but it should also impact how we live and respond to life's challenges. Our joy should make it easier for us to obey Jesus when he asks us to deny ourselves. Love our enemies. Give to the poor. And love our neighbor. This joy in finding the greatest treasure, Jesus, results in a radical life change. It's the kind of change that causes other people to wonder and ask questions. Why are you so different? Like, what is going on with you? Why would you sell everything to own this one thing? Why would you sell all that you own to own this one pearl? It doesn't make much sense. And yet, when we find that thing that we value and we treasure more than anything else, we're willing, with joy, to give it all to have that one thing. And so these two parables encourage me to think about my own life and my relationship with Jesus. Does my greatest joy come from my relationship with him? Or maybe from my circumstances? Or maybe from my possessions? What is my greatest treasure? What's that valuable that I would be willing to give everything to chase after? Another big thing about parables is they almost have a shocking part to them. Something that shocks, uh, at least Jesus' parables, it's always something shocking or a, a twist on it, right? And so if we think about it, the Good Samaritan. We have the, good, the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, the, the, there's someone who's beat up and half dead laying on the side of the road. And we have, uh, what, a Pharisee? And a Levite walk right on by, you know, skirt not getting too close to. But then we have, what? Well, it's shocking. The enemy of the Jewish people, right? What they would consider enemies. The Samaritan who has mercy on him and stops and bandages his wounds, takes him to an end, pays for everything. The Jewish people of that time, they would have been shocked. What? Are you kidding? The Samaritan? It wasn't, the, it wasn't the Pharisee? Uh, the, the parable of the mustard seed. I was actually just listening to something on that this week. And the mustard seed is a really shocking parable. Um, 
You know, a mustard is like an invasive weed. Once mustard is planted, you might as well just sell the field and start, off some, start over somewhere else. And yet, this, so it wasn't something that was desirable. And yet Jesus linked the mustard seed to the kingdom of God, saying that this little tiny seed would grow into something that's large and that's hard to kill and that you can't get rid of once it gets going, right? But shocking because who would want, you know, because Jesus says a man planted a mustard seed in his field. It's like, who would want to do that? It's shocking. Um, the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower is a shocking one. You know, whether it's the story or the parable of where the man is spreading his seed all over, and some falls on the path, and some falls on the rocky soil, and some falls on the weedy soil, and then some falls on the good soil. Well, what's shocking about that? Well, in this time, to be so frivolous, to be so careless with your seed would have been unheard of. Like, this seed was what you ate. If you, if you were planting it, that means you were taking food out of your family's mouth or your animals or livestock's mouth. And so to be so frivolous and generous with the seed scattering was like, whoa, this is weird. This is shocking. No, if you were in this time, you would want to make sure that you're just getting the seed in the good soil. And yet Jesus tells this parable and it shocks them. So what would have been shocking about, to the original hearers about this parable? I think as it is, as we just talked about it, it's kind of shocking to us because we don't like this idea of giving up everything, to sell everything to go after this. Yet, if we think about it from, if we th go back and think, okay, what did they think the kingdom of God was like? They often had in their mind this idea, because we see it throughout the, the scriptures, that the kingdom of God was going to be this military conquest, right? That they're going to overthrow the Romans, push everyone out, they're going to have their own land again. And for them, yeah, I could give everything to get behind that, right? Like, I'm willing to. In fact, the zealots, who were a religious military group, they did just that. They sold everything, they went together, they, they, they trained and planned for the day when they would be able to throw out the Romans. And so I'm not so sure that this parable, um, as we currently interpret it, would have shocked them like that. They were already sold out for the cause of the kingdom of God coming to earth. So this made me think about it from a little bit different perspective and a little bit different angle. And I was always thinking about it and wrestling with this. Um, I had this uh, thought. And if I look through all the parables in, in um, Matthew chapter 13, the main character in each of those parables is God. And yet when we come to the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl, oftentimes we are interpreted as the main character of this story. But what if God was intended to be the main character of this parable? What would that say? What would that say? What, would that, what message would that be trying to convey? What would Jesus be trying to teach his followers, his disciples, about his kingdom? Well, let's, let's look at it real quick through this lens. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had, and he bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had, and he bought it. See, we can read through, throughout Scripture that God has a treasured possession. His people. God has a treasured possession. 
his people. And when he found them, he, in joy, gave up everything that he might obtain this treasured possession. Jesus gave it all for us. In joy and in love, he gave up the glory of heaven. Angels around the throne singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Day and night. If there is night, I don't quite. All the time, I'll just say that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he gave it up in joy and in love so that he might obtain this treasure that he found in his people. Now this type of kingdom would have been shocking to first century Jews. Like, oh, you're not coming in to throw out the Romans? You're actually going to give up everything that you might obtain the people of God? That's shocking. That, that he would literally th th give it all so that he could obtain and set us free. They were expecting a conquering kingdom that, came, that comes to set them free, yet Jesus is going to give up everything, even his own life, to have us, his treasure, and to set us free. If Jesus was willing to give it all that he might have us, what should our response be? He's asking us today, do you love me? Will you marry me? Will you give up everything else in joy to follow me? Are we willing to give it all just to obtain him, just to have, just to have this relationship with him? This is Jesus' marriage proposal. Are we, Jesus' disciples, willing to say yes to him at the cost of saying no to everything else. And I'm not saying you have to go and sell all of your possessions, but are we willing to do whatever it takes to obtain him? Are we willing to surrender whatever we are holding on to, the thing that we want to say yes to, but Jesus is calling us to say no to? Are we willing to give that up in joy because we value him and his kingdom so much? Are we willing to walk in that type of obedience? Because as we see, he did. He valued us so much that he was willing to give it all. And our response, I think, should be likewise. If you've never, I know most of you have kind of grown up in this church, and, but if you've never said yes, said yes to the kingdom, Yes to Jesus. Yes to, to say, Jesus, you did it all for me. I want to give all for you. If you've never placed your trust in him, I invite you to, to think about that right now because he is the most valuable treasure we could ever have. And it is worth it to go all in and say, yes, I will marry you in this instance. Yes, I'll give it all for you. It's so worth it. And so as you uh, bow your heads, we're going to close in just a word of prayer. Jesus, we thank you for today. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your word and how it reveals you to us in new, exciting ways, different ways that we might have seen. It's alive and active sharper than any two-edged sword. And it penetrates us. It, it speaks to us. And it sometimes convicts us. And that's what we need sometimes. So Lord, I just pray you would convict our hearts where we need it. Lord, I pray that we would say yes to you at all, whatever the cost. That we would go wholeheartedly after you that we would pursue you, we'd be willing to sell all that we have just to obtain this treasure in you. Lord, you are so good. 
you're so good. We sang about your goodness today. We heard about your goodness in the word. Lord, I pray that you would help us to experience and live out of that goodness as we leave this place. And that we would tell others about the goodness that you have shown us. Lord, we thank you for this time. I pray that you just continue to speak to us. Um, and, and as we leave this place, that we might continue to uh, chase after you and, uh, and do everything we can to obtain this treasure. In Jesus' name, amen.